Hey class, welcome back for uh, the next couple of chapters of Matilda. Something that I've been thinking a lot about with this book is how long the author Roald Dahl spends um, introducing the characters and working on character development. Um, and that's definitely a trait of his because that's something that I noticed in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory as well. The early chapters of that book he spent um, developing Charlie as a character and letting us get to know him. Um, and he's done that a lot with Matilda and her family as well. Um, you're going to continue with that here in the first chapter that I read to you titled The Platinum Blonde Man. That's another chapter sort of set in Matilda's home with her parents. Um, and then we're going to start to get introduced to other really important characters in the book after that um, and start to expand our story and expand what happens to Matilda um, as she starts school. So here we go. The Platinum Blonde Man. There was no doubt in Matilda's mind that this latest display of foulness by her father deserved severe punishment. And as she sat eating her awful fried fish and fried chips and ignoring the television, her brain went to work on various possibilities. By the time she went up to bed, her mind was made up. The next morning, she got up early and went into the bathroom and locked the door. As we already know, Mrs. Wormwood's hair was dyed a brilliant platinum blonde, very much the same glistening silvery color as the female tightrope walker's tights in the circus. The big dye job was done twice a year at the hairdressers, but every month or so in between, Mrs. Wormwood used, freshen, um, used to freshen it up by giving it a rinse in the wash bin with something called Platinum Blonde Hair Dye Extra Strong. This also served to dye the nasty brown hairs that kept growing out of the roots underneath. The bottle of Platinum Blonde Hair Dye Extra Strong was kept in the cupboard in the bathroom, and underneath the title on the label were written the words, Caution. This is peroxide. Keep away from children. Matilda had read it many times with fascination. Matilda's father had a fine crop of black hair, which he parted in the middle, and of which he was exceedingly proud. Good strong hair, he was fond of saying, means there's a good strong brain underneath. Like Shakespeare, Matilda had once said to him. Like who? Shakespeare, Daddy. Was he brainy? Very, Daddy. He had masses of hair, did he? He was bald, Daddy. To which the father had snapped, If you can't talk sense, then shut up. Anyway, Mr. Wormwood kept his hair looking bright and strong, or so he thought, by rubbing it every morning with large quantities of a lotion called Oil of Violet's Hair Tonic. The bottle of this smelly purple mixture always stood on the shelf above the sink in the bathroom, alongside all the toothbrushes, and a very vigorous scalp massage with oil of violets took place daily after shaving was completed. This hair and scalp massage was always accompanied by, a loud, mas uh, by loud masculine grunts and heavy breathing and gasps of, ah, that's better, that's the stuff. Rub it right into the roots, which could clearly be heard by Matilda in her bedroom across the corridor. Now, in the early morning privacy of the bathroom, Matilda unscrewed the cap of her father's oil of violets and tipped three quarters of the contents down the drain. Then she filled the bottle with her mother's platinum blonde hair dye extra strong. She carefully left enough of her father's original hair tonic in the bottle so that when, he, she, when she gave it a good shake, the whole thing still looked reasonably purple. Then she replaced the bottle on the shelf above the sink, taking care to put her mother's bottle back in the cupboard. So far, so good. At breakfast time, Matilda sat quietly in the dining room table, at the dining room table, eating her cornflakes. Her brother sat opposite her with his back to the door, devouring hunks of bread smothered with a mixture of peanut butter and strawberry jam. The mother was just out of sight around the corner in the kitchen making Mr. Wormwood's breakfast, which always had to be two fried eggs on, a, on fried bread with three pork sausages and three strips of bacon and some fried tomatoes. At this point, Mr. Wormwood came noisily into the room. He was incapable of entering any room quietly, especially at breakfast time. He always had to make his appearance felt immediately by creating a lot of noise and clatter. One could almost hear him saying, It's me, I'm here. The great man himself, the master of the house, the wage earner, the one who makes all of this possible for the rest of you to live so well. Notice me and pay your respects. On this occasion, he strode in and slapped his son on the back and shouted, Well, my boy, your father feels like he's in for another great money-making day today at the garage. I've got a few little beauties that I'm going to 
flog out to idiots this morning. Where's my breakfast? It's coming, treasure, Mrs. Wormwood called from the kitchen. Matilda kept her face bent low over her cornflakes. She didn't dare look up. In the first place, she wasn't at all sure that what she was going to see, and secondly, if she did see what she thought she was going to see, she wouldn't trust herself to keep a straight face. The sun was looking directly ahead out the window, stuffing himself with bread and peanut butter and strawberry jam. The father was just moving around to sit at the head of the table when the mother came sweeping out from the kitchen, carrying a huge plate piled high with eggs and sausages and bacon and tomatoes. She looked up. She caught sight of her husband. She stopped dead. Then she let out a scream that seemed to lift her right up into the air, and she dropped the plate with a crash and a splash onto the floor. Everyone jumped, including Mr. Wormwood. What the heck's the matter with you, woman? He shouted. Look at the mess you've made of the cup on the carpet. Your hair! The mother shrieked, pointing and quivering a finger at her husband. Look at your hair! What have you done to your hair? What's wrong with my hair, for heaven's sake? He said. Oh my God, Dad, what have you done with your hair? The son shouted. A splendid, noisy scene was building up nicely in the breakfast room. Matilda said nothing. She simply sat there, admiring the wonderful effect of her own handiwork. Mr. Wormwood's fine crop of black hair was now as dirty silver, the color, this time, of the tight ropers' tights that had not been washed for the entire circus season. You've, you've, you've dyed it, shrieked the mother. Why did you do it, you fool? It looks absolutely frightful. It looks horrendous. You look like a freak. What the blazes are you talking about, the father yelled, putting both his hands in his hair. I most certainly did not dye it. What do you mean I've dyed it? What's happened to it? Or is this some sort of stupid joke? His face was turning pale green, the color of sour apples. You must have dyed it, Dad, the son said. It's the same color as Mom's, only much dirtier looking. Of course he's dyed it, the mother cried. It can't change color all by itself. What on earth were you trying to do? Make yourself look handsome or something? You look like someone's grandmother gone wrong. Get me a mirror, the father yelled. Don't just stand there shrieking at me. Get me a mirror. The, mo in, uh, the mother's handbag lay on the chair at the other end of the table. She opened the bag and got out a powder compact that had a small round mirror on the inside of the lid. She opened the compact and handed it to her husband. He grabbed it and held it out before his face, and in doing so, spilled most of the powder all over the front of his fancy tweed jacket. Be careful, shrieked the mother. Now look what you've done. That's my best Elizabeth Arden face powder. Oh my God, yelled the father, staring into the mirror. What's happened to me? I look terrible. I look just like you gone wrong. I can't go down to the garage like this and sell cars. How did it happen? He stared around the room, first at the mother, then at the son, then at Matilda. How could it have happened, he yelled. I imagine, Daddy, Matilda said quietly, that you weren't looking very hard and you simply took Mummy's bottle of hair stuff off the shelf instead of your own. Of course that's what happened, the mother cried. Well, really, Harry, how stupid can you get? Why didn't you read the label before you started splashing the stuff all over? Mine's terribly strong. It's only meant to you. I'm only meant to use one tablespoon of it in the whole basin of water, and you've gone and put it all over your head. It'll probably take all your hair off in the end. Is your scalp beginning to burn, dear? You mean I'm going to lose all my hair? The husband yells. I think you will, the mother said. Peroxide is a very powerful chemical. It's what they put down the lavatory to disinfect the pan only after the only they've given it a, another name. That's what they're saying is that it can also be used for cleaning. What are you saying? The husband cried. I'm not a lavatory pan. I don't want to be disinfected. Even diluted like I use it, the mother told him. It makes a good deal of my hair fall out, so goodness knows what's going to happen to you. I'm surprised it didn't take off the whole top of your head. What shall I do, wailed the father. Tell me quick, what do I do before it starts falling out? Matilda said, I'd give it a good wash, Dad, if I were you, with soap and water. But you'll have to hurry. Will that change the color back? The father said anxiously. Of course it won't, you twit, the mother said. Then what do I do? I can't go around looking like this forever. 
You'll have to dye it black, the mother said. But wash it out first, or there won't be any there to dye. Right, the father shouted, springing into action. Get me an appointment with your hairdresser this instant for a hair dyeing job. Tell them it's an emergency. They've got to boot someone else off the list. I'm going upstairs to wash it now. With that, the man dashed out of the room, and Mrs. Wormwood sighed deeply, went to the telephone, and called the beauty parlor. He does some pretty silly things now and again, doesn't he, mummy? Matilda said. The mother, dialing the number on the phone, said, I'm afraid men are not always quite as clever as they think they are. You will learn that when you get a bit older, my girl. All right. The next chapter is titled Miss Honey. Matilda was a little late in starting school. Most children re begin primary school at five or even just before. But Matilda's parents, who weren't very concerned one way or the other about their daughter's education, had forgotten to make the proper arrangements in advance. She was five and a half when she entered school for the first time. The village school for younger, younger children was a bleak brick building called the, Crunch, the Crunchum Hall Primary School. It had about 250 pupils aged from five to just under 12 years old. The head teacher, the boss, the supreme commander of this establishment was the formidable middle-aged lady whose name was Miss Trunchbull. Naturally, Matilda was put in the bottom class where there are only where there are eighteen other small boys and girls about the same age as her. Their teacher was Miss Honey, and she could not have been more than twenty three or twenty four She had a lovely pale oval Madonna face with blue eyes, and her hair was light brown. Her body was so slim and fragile one got the feeling that if she fell over, she would smash into a thousand pieces like a porcelain figure. Miss Jennifer Honey was a mild and quiet person who never raised her voice and was seldom seen to smile. But there was no doubt that she possessed that rare gift for being adored by every small child under her care. She seemed to understand totally the bewilderment and the fear that so often overwhelms young children who for the first time in their lives are herded into a classroom and told to obey orders. Some curious warmth that was almost tangible, shone out of Miss Honey's face when she spoke to a confused and homesick newcomer in the class. Miss Trunchbull, the headmistress, was something else altogether. She was a gigantic, holy terror, a fierce, tyrannical monster who frightened the life out of the pupils and teachers alike. There was an aura of menace about her, even at a distance. And when she came up close, you could almost feel the dangerous heat radiating from her from her as the red hot you could almost feel the dangerous heat radiating from her as a red hot rod of metal when she marched miss trunchbull never walked she always marched like a stormtrooper with long strides and arms swinging when she marched along the corridor you could actually hear her snorting as she went and if the group of children happened to be in her path she plowed right on through them like a tank, with small people bouncing off her to the left and right. Thank goodness we don't meet many people like her in the world, although they do exist, and all of us are likely to come across at least one of them in our lifetime. If you ever do, you should behave as you would if you met an enraged rhinoceros out in the bush. Climb up the nearest tree and stay there until it's gone away. This woman, in all her eccentricities, and in her appearance is almost as impossible to describe, but I shall make some attempt to do so later on. Let us leave her for a moment and go back to Matilda and her first day in Miss Honey's class. After the usual business of going through all the names of the children, Miss Honey handed out a brand new exercise book to each pupil. They don't mean exercises like in PE class, they mean um, work that you do in class. You have all brought your own pencils, I hope, she said. Yes, Miss Honey, they chanted. Good. Now this is the very first day of school for each one of you. It is the beginning of at least 11 long years of schooling that you are going to have to go through. And six of those years will be spent right here at Crunchum Hall, where, as you know, your headmistress is Miss Trunchbull. 
let me, for your own good, tell you something about Miss Trunchbull. She insists upon strict discipline throughout the school, and if you take my advice, you will do your very best to behave yourselves in her presence. Never argue with her. Never answer her back. Always do as she says. If you get on the wrong side of Miss Trunchbull, she can liquidize you like a carrot in a kitchen blender. It's nothing to laugh about, Lavender. Take that grin off your face. All of you will be wise to remember that Miss Trunchbull deals very, very severely with anyone who gets out of line in this school. Have you got the message? Yes, Miss Honey, chirped 18 eager little voices. I myself, Miss Honey went on, want to help you learn as much as possible while you're in this class. That is because I know it will make things easier for you later on. For example, by the end of this week, I shall expect every one of you to know the two times tables by heart. And in a year's time, I hope that you'll know all the multiplication tables up to 12. It will help you enormously if you do. Now then, do any of you happen to have learnt the two times tables already? Probably not surprisingly to all of you. Matilda put her hand up. She was the only one. Miss Honey looked carefully at the tiny girl with dark hair and a round, serious face sitting in the second row. Wonderful, she said. Please stand up and recite as much of it as you can. Matilda stood up and began to say the two times tables. When she got to twice 12 as 24, she didn't stop. She went right on with twice 13 as 26, twice 14 as 28, twice 15 as 30, twice 16. Stop, Miss Honey said. She had been listening, slightly spellbound, to the smooth recital, and now said, How far can you go? How far? Matilda said. Well, I don't really know, Miss Honey. For quite a long way, I think. Miss Honey took a few moments to let this curious statement sink in. You mean, she said, that you could tell me that two time you could tell me what two times twenty eight is? Yes, Miss Honey. What is it? Fifty six, Miss Honey. What about something much harder, like two times four hundred and seventy eight? Could you tell me that? Yes, I think so, Matilda said. Are you sure? Why, yes, Miss Honey, I'm fairly sure. What is it then? Two times 478. Uh, 87, sorry about that. 974, Matilda said immediately. She spoke quietly and politely and without any sign of showing off. Miss Honey gazed at Matilda with absolute amazement. But, what, but when she spoke next, she kept her voice level. That is really splendid, she said. But of course, multiplying by two is a lot easier than some of the bigger numbers. What about the other multiplication tables? Do you know any of those? I think so, Miss Honey. I think I do. Which ones, Matilda? How far have you got? I I don't quite know, Matilda said. I don't know what you mean. What I mean is, do you, for instance, know the three times tables? Yes, Miss Honey. And the four times tables? Yes, Miss Honey. Well. How many do you know, Matilda? Do you know them all the way up to 12 times table? Yes, Miss Honey. Keep in mind, she's five, guys. What about 12 sevens? 84, Matilda said. Miss Honey paused and leaned back in her chair behind the plain table that stood in the middle of the floor in front of the class. She was considerably shaken by this exchange, but took care not to show it. She had never come across a five-year-old before, or indeed a ten-year-old who could multiply with such facility, such faculty, I'm sorry. I hope the rest... Oh, sorry about that. Our power just almost went out. Uh, I hope the rest of you are listening to this, she said to the class. Matilda is a very lucky girl. She has wonderful parents who have already taught her to multiply lots of numbers. Was it your mother, Matilda, who taught you? No, Miss Honey, it wasn't. You must have a great father, then. He must be a brilliant teacher. No, Miss Honey, Matilda said quietly. My father did not teach me. You mean you taught yourself? I don't quite know, Matilda said, truthfully. It's just that I don't find it very difficult to multiply one number by another. Miss Honey took a deep breath and let it out slowly. She looked again at the small girl with bright eyes standing beside her desk, so sensible and solemn. You say you don't find it difficult to multiply one number by another, Miss Honey said. Could you try to explain that a bit? 
Oh dear, Matilda said. I'm not really sure. Miss Honey waited. The class was silent, all listening. For instance, Miss Honey said, if I asked you to multiply 14 by 19. No, that's too difficult. It's 266, Matilda said softly. Miss Honey stared at her. Then she picked up a pencil and quickly worked out the sum on a piece of paper. What did you say it was, she said, looking up. 266, Matilda said. Miss Honey put down her pencil and removed her spectacles and began to polish the lenses with a piece of tissue. The class remained quiet, watching her and waiting for what was coming next. Matilda was standing up beside her desk. Now tell me, Matilda, Miss Honey said, still polishing. Try to tell me exactly what goes on inside your head when you get a multiplication, when you get a multiplication like that. You obviously have to work it out in some way, but you seem able to arrive at the answer almost instantly. Take one you've just done, 14 and multiply by 19. I, I, I simply put 14 down in my head and I multiply it by 19, Matilda said. I'm afraid I don't know how else to explain it. I've always said to myself that if a little pop, pocket calculator can do it, then why shouldn't I? Why not indeed, Miss Honey said. The human brain is an amaz amazing thing. I think it's a lot better than a lump of metal, Matilda said. That's all a calculator is. How right you are, Miss Honey said. Pocket calculators are not allowed in this school anyway. Miss Honey was feeling quite quivery. There was no doubt in her mind that she had met a truly extraordinary mathematical brain, and the word, and words like child genius and prodigy were flitting around through her head. She knew that these sorts of wonders do pop up in the world from time to time, but only once or twice in a hundred years. After all, Mozart was only five when he started composing for the piano, and look what happened to him. It's not fair, Lavender said. How could she do it and we can't? Don't worry, Lavender. You'll soon catch up, Miss Honey said, lying through her teeth. At this point, Miss Honey could not resist the temptation of exploring still further the mind of this astonishing child. She knew that she ought to be paying some attention to the rest of the class, but she was altogether too excited to let this matter rest. Well, she said, pretending to address the whole class, let us leave sums for a moment, and we'll see if any of you have begun to learn to spell. Hands up if anyone can spell cat. Three hands went up. They belong to Lavender, a small boy named Nigel, and to Matilda. Spell cat, Nigel. Nigel spelled it. Miss Honey now decided to ask a question that normally she would not have dreamed of asking the class on its first day. I wonder, she said, whether any of the three of you knows how to spell that knows how to spell cat have learned how to read a whole group of words when they are strung together in a sentence. I have, Nigel said. So have I, Lavender said. Miss Honey went to the blackboard and wrote with her white chalk the sentence, I have already begun to learn how to read long sentences. She had purposely made it difficult, and she knew that there were precious few five-year-olds. Sorry, there's just a plow going by. It distracted me. She had purposely made it difficult, and she knew that there were precious few five-year-olds around who would be able to manage to read it. Can you tell me what it says, Nigel? She asked. That's too hard, Nigel said. Lavender, the first word is I, Lavender said. Can any of you read the whole sentence? Miss Honey asked, waiting for the yes that she felt was certain to be coming from Matilda. Yes, Matilda said. Go ahead, Miss Honey said. Matilda read the sentence without any hesitation at all. That is really good indeed, Miss Honey said, making the understatement of her life. How much can you read, Matilda? I think I can read most things, Miss Honey, Matilda said, although I'm afraid I can't always understand the meanings. Miss Honey got to her feet and walked smartly out of the room, but she was back in 30 seconds carrying a thick book. She opened at random and placed it on Matilda's desk. This book, this is a book of humorous poetry, she said. See if you can read that one aloud. Smoothly, without pause, and at a nice speed, Matilda began to read. An epicure dining at crew found a rather large mouse in his stew cried the waiter, don't shout, and wave it about, or the rest will be wanting one too. 
Several children saw the funny side of the rhyme and laughed. Miss Honey said, Do you know what an epicure is, Matilda? It's someone who is dainty with his eating, Matilda said. That is correct, Miss Honey said. And do you happen to know what a particular type of what that particular type of poetry is called? It's called a limerick, Matilda said. That's a lovely one. It's so funny. It's a famous one, Miss Honey said, picking up the book and returning it to the table in the front of the class. A witty limerick is very hard to write, she added. It, they look easy, but they are most certainly not. I know, Matilda said. I've tried quite a few times, but mine are never any good. You have, have you? Miss Honey said, more startled than ever. Well, Matilda, I would very much like to hear one of these limericks that you say you've written. Could you try to remember one for us? Well, Matilda said, hesitating. I've actually been trying to make up one about you, Miss Honey, while we've been sitting here. About me? Miss Honey cried. Well, we've certainly got to hear that one, haven't we? I don't think I want to say it, Miss Honey. Please tell it, Miss Honey said. I promise I won't mind. I think you will, Miss Honey, because I have to use your first name to make things rhyme, and that's why I don't want to say it. How do you know my first name? Miss Honey asked. I heard another teacher calling it to you, calling you by it, just before we came in, Matilda said. She called you Jenny. I insist upon hearing this limerick, Miss Honey said, smiling, one of her rare smiles. Stand up and recite it. Reluctantly, Matilda stood up very slowly, very nervously, and recited her limerick. The thing we all ask about Jenny is surely there cannot be many. Young girls in the place with so lovely a face, the answer to that is not any. The whole of Miss Honey's pale and pleasant face blushed a brilliant scarlet. Then, once again, she smiled. It was a much broader one this time, a smile of pure pleasure. Why, thank you, Matilda, she said, still smiling. Although it is not true, it is really very good limerick. Oh, dear, oh, dear, I must try to remember that one. From the third row of desks, Labsner said, It's good, I like it. It's true as well, a small boy, called Rupert said. Of course it's true, Nigel said. Already the whole class had begun to warm towards Miss Honey. Although not, although, as yet, she had hardly taken notice of any of them except Matilda. Who taught you to read, Matilda? Miss Honey asked. I just sort of taught myself, Miss Honey. And you have read, have you read any books all by yourself? Any children's books, I mean. I've read all the ones that are in the public library in the high street, library in high street, Miss Honey. And did you like them? I like some of them very much indeed, Matilda said, but I thought others were fairly dull. Tell me which ones you liked. I liked The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Matilda said. I think Mr. C.S. Lewis is a very good writer, but he has one failing. There are no funny bits in his books. You are right there, Miss Honey said. There aren't many funny bits in Mr. Tolkien either, Matilda said. Do you think that all children's books ought to have funny bits in them, Miss Honey said. I do, Matilda said. Children are not so serious as grown-ups, and they love to laugh. Miss Honey was astonished by the wisdom of this tiny girl. She said, And what are you going to do now that you've read all the children's books? I'm reading the I'm reading other books, Matilda said. I borrow them from the library. Mrs. Phelps is very kind to me. She helps me choose them. Miss Honey was leaning far forward over her work table and gazing at the wonder of a child. She had completely forgotten about the rest of the class. What other books? she murmured. I'm very fond of Charles Dickens, Matilda said. He makes me laugh a lot, especially Mr. Pickwick. At that moment, the bell in the corridor sounded for the class, for the end of class. And that was a rather long read aloud tonight. Um, that chapter was very long, so I apologize for that. But um, that is the way that our author Roald Dahl structured it. So um, let's have a great discussion about this today in our comment section.